opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. Our God, he holds a victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. And he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. Shout out your praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Yes, Lord. We shout your praise out this morning, God. You're good. I've been strong and I've been broken within a moment. I've been faithful and I've been reckless in every bend. I've held everything together and watched it shatter. I've stood tall and I have crumbled in the same breath. I have wrestled and I have trembled towards surrender. Chased my heart adrift and drifted home again. Plundered blessing till I've been desperate to find redemption. And every time I turn around, Lord, you're still there. Before. 
It's a grace I could never add up. Be somebody you still want somehow. Love me as you find, baby. I will linger and listen. I can't miss a thing. Lord, I know my heart wants more of you. My heart wants something new. So I surrender. Done by who you are. My desire is to know you deeper. And Lord, I will open up again, throw my fears into the wind. I am desperate for a touch of heaven. Oh, oh, oh. oh, oh. You're the fire in the morning, you're the cool in the evening, the breath in my soul, the life in my bones. There is no hesitation in your love and affection, is the sweetest of all. And Lord, I know my heart wants. Oh, 
to you. I open up my heart to you now. So do what only you can. Jesus, have your way in me now. I open up my heart to touch of heaven. Man, we can all use a touch of heaven this morning, church, and uh, we're going to enter into our time of communion this morning, and um, I just want to encourage you this morning to understand that, as I say every time we take communion, this is spiritual, man. This is more than just some religious thing that we do. There's power in communion, power in it. This is what the disciples had, the apostles had. They had communion. It was a moment for them to remember what our Lord and Savior Jesus had done. And as they broke the bread and as they took the cup, it wasn't symbolic to them. It was real. It was tangible. And so this morning, whatever you're bringing in here this morning, that you need a touch of heaven, lay it at the altar, have communion, with your Father in heaven and allow Him to wash over you. Be empowered by this moment, church. We invite you as we continue to worship, as you feel compelled, come up and partake of the bread and the cup and go and be seated and, and take it with a loved one or, or just by yourself. But Commune with your Father in heaven this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you indwell us and that you're here with us this morning. We praise you and we offer this all to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Lord, for being here in this presence and filling this place. Be with Pastor as he prepares to give your word to us, Lord. Minister to him so we can gain more knowledge of you, Lord. We come closer to you. We thank you in your name. Amen. I'm, you know, I'm just blown away by how quickly time is going by, right? I mean, it's like, I, I just feel like it was March when my family and I were back east and we went back there because my mother-in-law had passed away and, and it just, I don't know, there's, there's markers in our lives and that was just like a marker for me and that marker is like, it's almost a year, a year gone. And so I, I just want to encourage everybody to cherish the moments, to redeem the time. Stop being so busy, right? Spend quality time with your family, quality time. Not vegging out for hours in front of the TV together. Try quality time. Try interacting. Try engaging. Because church, I'm telling you, these moments, once they're gone, they're gone. We don't get them back. And, and sometimes we get in a, a depressive mind state because we realize that maybe we haven't done some things that we wish we'd have done or, or you know, things happen in our lives and, and, and we, we start battling depression. And we're going to continue our series of, uh, called Peace of Mind. And we're talking about a subject that the church don't like to talk about, which is mental health. But here's the point. What we have learned is that mental health is all throughout the, out the Bible. It's just a secular term that's being used. But God cares about our minds. As I told you, the mind is brought up over 300 and something times in the Bible. God cares about your mind. And in the upcoming weeks, as we close out this series, before we start our, our, our Christmas series we're going to have, and then in January I'm going to go through, I think I'm really being led to go through 2 Timothy, but I'm still praying about that. But we're going to talk about worry next week, right? We're going to talk about trauma. We're going to talk about subjects that the church normally doesn't like to talk about. I want to start out with a story of a really close friend of mine. His name was Tommy Archer. Loved this dude. He was the first person I met in California when I came here in 1968. We were close buddies. Great buddies, man. We grew up together. Tommy was a great guy, man. I mean, he laughed. He was fun to be around. He partied with us. He ran the streets with us. He was one of our boys. Everybody liked Tommy. It's like when you met this guy, everybody liked him. But there were times when Tommy would disappear on us. For weeks at a time, I'd be like, man, where's my dude at? Where's Tommy at? And then he would show back up and he'd be the same old Tommy. Everything would be good. And then we found something out. His mom mentioned something to another mother of, of one of my friends, and she said that Tommy had been battling with bouts of depression. Now here I'm thinking, here's this happy-go-lucky dude, man. Not, nobody in the world, had, he didn't seem to have any enemies. He was a great guy, but he was dealing with depression all the times. And come to find out when we became early adults that he had been battling years of suicidal thoughts and ongoing chronic and crippling depression. 
And once we found out what was going on, I mean, you know, our remedy was, hey, man, drink another beer or take another shot or smoke another joint or take another sniff of something, man. That's how you're going to feel better. We didn't really know how to help. And we figured, you know what? Everybody goes through this stuff, man. He'll eventually get better. Until one day I got a phone call that Tommy was dead. He had hung himself in the closet of his, of his room. And he left a note and he says, man, I can't take it anymore, man. I can't take the pain. I can't take the depression anymore. I'm done. And he checked out. We were devastated. This was one of our dudes. How could this happen? And then, man, is, was Tommy really that weak, you know, when people are depressed? Oh, you're just weak. But he took his own life. And we had so many questions as, as young adults, and we didn't understand it. Church, someone who hasn't experienced depression, real depression, they're very dismissive. Very dismissive. Cheer up. Get over it. Buck up. But let me tell you something. Depression is not just sadness. It's not that. It's not dis discouragement. We all go through sadness and discouragement. Let me tell you what depression is, man. It's a constant darkness that comes over you, that's in you. You have no feeling. You're numb. Anybody in here ever been like that? I have been depressed like that. I shared that with you some years back, or about me some years back. No motivation, no hope. That's what depression is. And it's sad because in the church, it should be the safest place to talk about depression. It's not a stigma. It's nothing to feel shamed about. It's nothing to feel guilty about. But like I said, in the church, suck it up, get over it, put your faith in. You don't have enough faith. Let me tell you something. If you have a sore throat, you go to a physician, right? If you need something removed from your body, you go see a surgeon. You go and you get help. You get the help that you need. In the church, if you're battling depression, let me tell you what we tell you. Just keep smiling. Keep it to yourself. We, want to, we don't want to hear your problems. Listen, if you're one of the many this morning that fights depression or has had de uh, a, a depressive moment in your life, you're facing one of the biggest mental health problems in America today. It's there. People go through depression. And the thing is, is that Satan uses that depression to destroy us. Now, there's a verse that I want to start with in the Bible this morning out of Proverbs 12, 25. And it reads, anxiety in the heart of a man causes depression. Remember, we talked about anxiety. It says, but a good word makes it glad. Have you ever had that when you've been having one of those days and somebody just comes in and just pumps you up with just, they say just the right thing, and you go, gosh, Lord, I needed that. There's so many times when I'm in the midst of everything, no other way to say it, and instead of somebody coming in and complaining to me about something, they come in and they give me encouragement. Man, pastor, I just want to tell you, man, even though you're a mess up, I still love you, Right? <laughs> I mean, that's the stuff. I mean, I'm telling you, man, an encouraging word, it makes the heart glad. And so, church, we're going to get into the word this morning because the word of God can change our heart and our perspective. The title of today's message is Two Truths to Remember When You're Battling Depression. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. I thank you, God, that. Um, You've given us the ability to gather, Lord, that we can come here, and Father, that we can be transparent and open with each other, Lord. Father, there's nothing hid from you, yet, Lord, so many times we act like we're hiding stuff, that you can't see it, but you know it, and Lord, you desperately want to help us. So this morning, Father, as we go into this study, I pray, God, that you would just enlighten our hearts, Holy Spirit, that you would... Help us to see, God, if there's areas of our lives that, that we really need to expose to you and, and, and work through some issues and situations, God. Above all, Lord, we want to honor you this morning. 
So thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all the church said, Amen. well, the first thing I want to say is I hope this isn't a depressing message for you, right? Because we're talking about depression. But listen, depression is a very complex issue. It doesn't discriminate, okay? If there's anybody that tells you that they've never been depressed, I don't believe it, okay? Now, I'm not saying I know everything, but I'm saying I know people. I've been dealing with them for more than 60 years, so I know. And it doesn't, it's not a one-size-fits-all situation. In fact, there's four root causes of depression that I want to talk to you about as we get started. The first one is biological. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, it could be a chemical imbalance. Some people have a chemical imbalance. Sometimes you need medication to help get the chemical balance, get it, get it straightened out. There's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes it's chronic pain, right? Maybe it's nutrition. Maybe you're not eating the right things. Maybe it's a hormonal change. I know that for, for women, there's that period in their lives when they go through that change. Maybe it's a lack of sleep. Maybe you're not getting enough exercise. Maybe it's too much sunlight. I don't know. But there's a biological reason that sometimes people are depressed. Sometimes it's relational. Somebody betrayed you. Somebody that was close to you that you loved, that you cared for, wounded you. And it hurts your heart and your soul, and you feel betrayed. Maybe somebody rejected you. Maybe you went through a divorce. Maybe you've been isolated. And, and just that we were built for relationship, church. I hope you understand that. That's how God made us. He built us to be in relationship with each other. But maybe it's isolation. Maybe it's circumstantial. Maybe you just went through a death of somebody or the loss of something maybe it's trauma maybe you had a bankruptcy maybe you retired and now that change of life has got you going maybe kids leaving home is depressed let me tell you i was depressed and excited when my kids left i'm going to tell you something like man i'm sorry to see you go but yeah you know <laughs> right <laughs> right A amen man maybe it's spiritual church every moment of every day we're in a spiritual battle so maybe you're spiritually worn down and you're feeling depressed. Now, as I said, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a licensed counselor. I have a minor in counseling, right? I can't address all the aspects of depression, but I can give you some spiritual insights to depression, and that's where we always need to start. You always have to start from, with God. Too many people want to start with everybody else and then come to God when he's the last resort. You start with God and let God orchestrate your steps. God may tell you to go see a psychiatrist. He may tell you to go get counseling. He may tell you to go to the doctor, but start with God. So we always have to start with God, church. This morning, I want to share with you in Scripture a deeply depressed man who was fighting to hold on to God. He was fighting to hold on to God. We're going to be in Lamentations chapter 3. That's in the Old Testament. And we're going to be looking at the prophet Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah had battered, battled inner darkness and depression, and I'm going to share with you why and how. Now, Solomon's temple had been built, right, and it was considered one of the wonders of the world. It was so beautiful, and it was a tribute to God, and it was around for about 400 years until the Babylonians came in 58, 70, 587 B.C. And, and destroyed it and, and, and took all the, the inhabitants captive. Jeremiah witnesses this church. He witnesses it. He sees the dead bodies all over the place. He sees the destroyed temple with the dead bodies of the priests. His loved ones were killed. His family is deported. He's suffering in turmoil in his heart and his mind. He's like, how, God? How? <coughs> Excuse me. And so I want to read with you some key verses out of Lamentations chapter 3. We're going to start with the first two verses. It says, I saw the man who has seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Verse 5, he says, he has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. Listen to the prophet's words. 
He has made me, verse 6, he has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. He has walked me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Verse 8, even when I call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. Ooh. Verse 17, I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say, my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped for from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. And I will remember them and my soul is downcast within me. That's some pretty descriptive stuff, church right? Makes me walk in darkness rather than light. Yikes. Surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. Has made me dwell in darkness like those who are long dead. Wow. He shuts out my prayer. How many of you this morning feel like God doesn't hear your prayers? How many of you have been deprived of peace? The prophet talks about it. I've been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. He says, my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. He says, everything I've hoped for from God is gone. And then he ends in verse 20. He says, my soul is downcast within me. How in the world did he get there? This is a prophet, a man of God, somebody who loved God. Somebody who had a relationship with God. Somebody who was used by God. But yet the prophet speaks these words. Totally broken, lost, and helpless the prophet is. Now, if you look at these verses, I can tell you there's two things that he's experiencing. The circumstantial. His home is destroyed. The temple is destroyed. His family is killed or deported. And He's experiencing spiritual depression. He feels like God let him down. Where are you, God? How could you let this happen to me? How could you let this happen to my people? He had no hope. Well, this morning, as I shared with you the title, I want to talk to you about two truths to remember when you're battling depression. Two truths. The first one is this, your emotions are valid, but they're not permanent. And the second one is your situation feels hopeless, but with God, there's always hope. I, and, and I want you to understand that these two truths are our truths, but they're incomplete truths. They're incomplete. Listen, when you hurt, your emotions are valid. They're valid. When you feel angry, when you feel depressed, when you feel jealous, or when you feel any of these emotions, any of these things, they're valid, they're real. God placed them in us. But I'm going to tell you an important thing that you need to do when you are feeling these different emotions. You need to name them. You need to name the emotion. I feel angry right? I feel anxious. I feel betrayed. I feel empty. I feel numb. I feel afraid. Name what it is, and I'm going to tell you why. Anybody here afraid of spiders? Okay, I am, right? Spiders and snakes, that was an old song back in the 70s. I don't like spiders or snakes, or how'd that go? I can't remember what it was now, but anyways, that was an old song, right? So, Anyways, here's what they did. They did a study. I mean, people do studies on everything, right? But this is kind of funny. So they, they do a study about spiders. So, so they, they bring in this group of people. I don't know how the number is, probably 20, 30, could have been 100. I don't know. And, and these are people that are afraid of spiders. Now, here's the funny thing is they don't just bring in like a household little spider, man. These people come in and they surround this glass cage and there's a big old fat hairy tarantula in it. And so they made the people get as close as they could to the glass and observe this tarantula. And then they broke them into four groups. And each group had a different task. 
Group one, they had to label what they were feeling, right? What were they feeling? Fear, scared, anxious, right? Reserved, whatever it was. The second group just made observations, like it was in a cage, or, you know, there was grass or gravel in the cage. Uh, the, ca the cage was glass or whatever it was. The third group had to say something irrelevant, like, today's a good day, or today's a bad day, or the sky's blue, or the grass is green. And the fourth group didn't have to say anything at all. And so they told each, each study group to just think and dwell on this for a week. So a week comes by, they all show back up, they bring the tarantula back out in this big glass thing, and they brought the group together, and they wanted to look at the psychological responses of each person. Were they going to sweat? Was their heart rate going to go up? Were they still going to be skittish? What, what was going to be the reaction of the group? Well, here's the thing. Those who named what they were feeling about this tarantula, right, they performed the best. In fact, some of them were even able to touch it. I don't know why naming it helps. I can't tell you why, but I, I can tell you this, that when I'm honest and open about how I'm feeling about things and not telling 500 people about it, but bringing it to God and saying, Lord, this is how I'm feeling. I'm feeling angry today. I'm feeling anxious today, right? I open myself up to God in an amazing way. Listen, naming your emotions opens the door to changing your emotions. I'll say that again. Naming your emotions opens the door to changing your emotions. God gave us emotions. I shared that with you a moment ago. Our emotions are valid, but here's what I want you to understand about your emotions. They are not permanent. Your emotions are not permanent. And because our emotions are temporary, you and I need to write this down and keep it somewhere close to us. We're not going to make permanent decisions based on temporary emotions. We're not going to do that. We're going to stop doing those things. You might be battling depression this morning. You might feel like quitting your marriage. You might feel like quitting on God. You might feel like running away. You might want to shut out the world. You might have dark moments. Right? You might even be considering taking your life this morning. Don't make permanent decisions based on temporary emotions. Emotions are valid. Name them. Feel them. But don't be ruled by them. So many people I know are ruled by their emotions. You let your emotions run you. That drives me crazy. Everything's emotional. That's crazy to me. I learned a long time ago, I never make decisions based on how I'm emotionally feeling. Because I could do some real stupid stuff. You cannot be ruled by your emotions. My boy Tommy, his emotions ruled him. He was depressed. And you know what happened? He made a permanent decision. A decision that there was no turning back. There was no coming back. It wasn't a video game where I get another life. No, he was gone, and it broke our hearts, and we were angry, and we were upset, and we didn't know what to do. So your emotions are valid, church, but they're not permanent. The second thing I want you to think about is this. Your situation feels hopeless, but with God, there's always hope. With God, there's always hope. Jeremiah was depressed. But he turns to God after saying what he said in the earlier verses in chapter 3. Now look at what he says in, chap in verse 21. He says this, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Now he's calling to mind things, your mind. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Those are the greatest verses in the Bible. Listen. 
He just expressed, he just named what was going on inside of his heart and mind, church. He confessed it to God. He says, this is where I'm at, man. And then he calls God out. And where are you at, dude? Where are you at in all this? But he does something key here. He says, yet this I call to mind. And therefore I have hope. Church, I'm sorry, but some of you out there today with an earshot of my voice, you don't do this. You stay in the state that you're in because you refuse to change your mindset. Now, I'm not saying that the pain you're in isn't real. I'm not saying that. But you need to start looking to God. God for the help. God for the reinforcement. God for the direction. Like I said, he may direct you to go to a, a doctor. He may direct you, to the, but it has to start with God, church. Now, it's interesting here because the prophet says, because of the Lord's great love. Now, that word there in the Hebrew is hesed. It's hesed. And this word shows up 248 times in the Bible. It's a difficult word to translate. It's packed with tons of meaning. And the, in the English language, we can't even come close to what this word means. Now, as I've shared with you before, Hebrew words can take on many different meanings because of the tense or the root word. One word can be a thought or even a sentence, which is why I tell everybody, start studying the language. You need to learn it. If you want to understand the Bible, really understand the Bible, then start learning the language of the Bible. Now, translators have made Tons of attempts to define what this means. It's loving kindness, it's mercy, it's loyalty. Let me tell you this. It's impossible to describe this type of love apart from the fullness of who God's character is. So let me tell you what the word has said actually means in the Hebrew translation. It means unbreakable devotion to God's promises and covenantal commitment to God's character. That's what it means. In other words, because of his great love, who he is, God is the standard. God is God. Is God. He's got he's to be everything in our lives. Because of that, we're not consumed. God won't allow us to be consumed, church. He loves us too much. And so this, this great love, it's a consuming love. It's, a, it's, a, it's an unbreakable devotion to God's promises. Are you devoted to God's promises this morning? Do you, do you rely on God's promises this morning? It's so key that we do, church. Then Jeremiah says something else. He says, his compassion never fails. So his great love for us, and his compassion never fails. Now, the word in Hebrew here is kind of a weird, weird word. It's rahama, okay? And, and it's the, the same root word, which means a mother's womb. A mother's womb. So, in other words, the compassion that God has for us, it's, it's like being in the womb of a mom. It's a safe place. It's the sanctuary where life begins on earth. The womb is the sanctuary of life. And there in the womb, the child is nourished and strengthened and is protected there. That's the picture of God's compassion for us. His compassion is if we are in the womb of, of, of our mothers. And that compassion that, that surrounds and engulfs is what sustains us, church. So what do you do to break out of the darkness, church? You have to acknowledge it, right? When you tell somebody you need help, it's not a sign of weakness, right? It's a sign of what? Wisdom. Wisdom. Like I said, you might need a counselor. You might need medicine. You might need to change your diet. You might need to exercise. You might not need to start, you know, uh, keeping a journal or something. Last week, we talked about pray, pause, and praise, right? Maybe that's what you need to do. You need to pray. You need to break and pause, and then you need to start praising God. You need to change the posture of your thinking is what you need to do. In Jeremiah's words, you can see that he's very downcast. He says, my soul is downcast. You ever notice when people are down or depressed, how do they look? They look miserable. 
Because they are. They're hurting. They're in pain. They're dealing with this, this, this emotion that just has a grip on them. At church, when, when, you're, when you're depressed, you, your, your posture can sometimes reflect your mood. I can tell when people are feeling good and not feeling good just by their posture, just by their demeanor. And let me tell you something, your posture can impact your mood. You're, see, we live in a, I grew up in a difference of time, but I remember all the time it was like, stand up straight, put your shoulders back, stop slouching, you know, blah, 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 blah. Hey, we don't care how kids look. They have kids walk around all day like this, you know. Half the reason is because they're, they're so used to this position with their video games and stuff, right? But let me tell you something. Change your posture, man. Change your posture. Change how you look and how you think of yourself, right? Right? Put your arms up. It doesn't have to be a sign of surrender. It could be a sign of victory for you. The point is, is that we need to... Physically, we sometimes have to do things to get ourselves back up. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 24 says, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope is in him, is, whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. He says, I say to myself, do any of you ever preach to yourselves? I do. I have to sometimes preach to myself to just keep me in the game, just to encourage me. I have to start preaching to myself. I have to start saying things to get myself where I need to be at. My, my life verse, Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is, is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? That is my verse. That's my go-to verse. That's the verse I stand on, right? He is my light and my salvation. I have nothing to fear. He's the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I should only fear God, right? God is my refuge and my strength, right? An ever-present help in what? Time of trouble, right? Or I'll paraphrase, like I can't do all of uh, Romans 8, 28 and the last three or four verses. So I'll say something like, Nothing in all creation can separate me from God. The love of God is so great that in Christ Jesus, I'm safe. I have peace. Because I got Jesus, nothing can separate me. My boy Tommy, I'm never going to see him again on the face of this earth. I'll never see him. I pray, I pray that maybe in that moment when he made that decision, that he was like the thief on the cross, and he said, Jesus, remember me. I pray I'll see him again because he was that good of a dude. He was an amazing, amazing friend and a, a good friend, a loyal friend. He never snitched. No, nah, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> and I wished that I had been a believer then because I would have shared with him the hope of Jesus. Shared with him that, man, listen, dude, there's people that want to help you, man. You don't have to go through this alone. That the church that I go to is a safe place, right? There's people that are going to love you and care for you no matter what. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We're all sinners, church, saved by grace. I don't care what you've done. I'm so sick of this judgmental attitude that we have as if that sin is worse than this sin, Right? It's all sin. It's all sin. And when we realize in humility that it's all sin, then I'm not going to judge you if you come to me with, with something. I'm not going to say, oh, sh depression, pff, you weak-minded, you know? No, I'm going to say, oh, my gosh, man, I love you and I'm here for you. How can I help you? What, how, what can the church do for you? What can the church do for you? Church, this morning, as I close, I want you to get so real with God in yourself today. And, and, and I'm, always, I, you know, I'm always careful about what I share. You know, there's that old joke about the three pastors, you know, where you know, the, the three of them get together and they're, they're, they're going to meet once a week. And one's from this church, one's from that church, one's from the church down the street. And 
the one pastor says, hey, you know what, next time we meet, man, he goes, let's, let's all tell, us, tell what our secret sin is, you know. And they're like, okay, all right, let's do that. So they meet, next time they meet, and the first pastor says, well, I guess I'll start. He goes, man, he goes, I'm a raging alcoholic, man. He says, man, I'm, I'm chugging him down before I get up on the stage and even, even begin to preach, man. <laughs> Second dude goes, man, well, he goes, that kind of frees me up, man. He says, man, I love smoking weed, <laughs> man. I love to light one up, man, anytime that I can, and I smoke before I get up and do anything, man. He goes, I just love smoking weed. The third one goes, well, he goes, my sin is gossip, and I can't, <laughs> and I can't wait to get out of here, right? So <laughs> be careful who you share stuff with, because some people are not spiritually mature enough to handle things. That's just the truth. I'm not trying to diss anybody this morning, but there's just some people that can't handle it, Right? Like, I never tell people my business who I know are always telling their business. The person who's always telling their business to everybody around, I never share anything in my life. Because you know why? Because I know you're going to share it. Because you got to share everything about yourself. See, I watch for things like that. That tells me I shouldn't probably talk to that person because I don't think I can trust them with any information. See, we have to be careful who we share, but you need to find somebody to share it with because your feelings are valid. They're not permanent, church. They're valid. Work through the feelings, but they're not permanent, so don't make permanent decisions based on your feelings. And remember that your situation, it feels hopeless. It does. It does feel hopeless. But with God, there's always hope. There's always hope with God. That has to be our starting point, church. This morning, if you're battling depression, let's take the steps together, together, to battle your way out of it. Because God wants you free. He wants you free. Amen. Lord, thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. And I thank you for my brothers and sisters. They're amazing people, God. I just, I just love them so much, and I know you love them more. And I pray for that person this morning, God, who's in need, who's just in need of you, in need of the miraculous, in need of the provision, in need of the help. Whatever it is, God, I pray, Lord, that you would guide them where they need to be at, that we, if it's, if it's us here, we can help. And if we don't have the resources or we don't have the the way of helping, Lord, that we can help them find what they need. Father, we're just feeble human beings just trying to figure this journey out, God. And so I just pray that you would help us, Lord, and be with us. Thank you, Father. We praise you today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen, amen. amen.